Coming up on Now See This. An underground construction crew has a run-in with deadly gas. I had told my crew, they said they're probably not going to make it. An officer on the beat has a run-in with a drunk. And a high-flying skydiver Look out! just runs in. Wrong side of the road. It's the end of the road. And the suspect hits that car. The end of their rope. And the end of the line. 1050 Central, 1050, cars on fire. Think you've seen it all? Now see this. Turning right on Honeysuckle. In Bowie County, Texas, Deputy Kelsey Coleman is on routine patrol when he comes across a late model pink Cadillac with broken taillights. I assumed that it was an elderly person in the car, and I, my attempt was, uh, I was gonna try to stop them at a local Easy Mart store and uh, try to fix their lights for them. <laughs> Coleman attempts to pull the motorist over by flashing his lights, but the driver doesn't stop. Still, the deputy maintains a cool head. I don't know if they've even seen my lights yet or not. But going about 40 miles an hour, and like I said, I think he's an elderly person. They may just be scared to pull over out here in the dark. The deputy decides to get the driver's attention using his cruiser's bullhorn. But the suspect continues driving, and Deputy Coleman can't help but laugh. <laughs> but as soon as backup arrives, the laughing stops. Kept driving and never getting over about 45 or 50 until we met another officer from Texarkana, Texas PD. Uh, after he saw that officer, the car began to speed away even faster. All right, Central, they're picking up the pace on me now. I don't know if they're trying to get away or what. Coleman soon realizes this may not be an elderly driver after all. The eight-cylinder Cadillac quickly leaves the deputy in its dust. The accelerated power of that vehicle was pretty awesome. I, there's no way that I could keep up with it. Deputy Coleman works the throttle, but is having trouble matching the suspect's speed. They're leaving me. I can't keep up with them. The driver easily pushes the Cadillac to 115 miles an hour. 323 drill. The suspect is just seconds from losing the officer completely when he makes one fatal error. 1050 Central, 1050, car's on fire. Car's on fire. We're, uh, we need live net first responders down here. We got lines down in the road. Hit a telephone pole, Central. The driver tries to take the turn at triple digit speeds and ends up slamming right through a utility pole. The colossal impact totals the car's sturdy frame and spontaneously ignites the Cadillac's engine. Fearing an explosion, Deputy Coleman slowly backs away from the disaster area. Power lines were a concern. Uh, in fact, he had cut the pole completely in half and it was left dangling uh, with the power lines and I did not know if any of the lines had fallen on the ground or to the car. Once officers determine there are no downed wires, they cautiously run to the driver's aid. Can you see anybody? Yeah, he's inside. Come on, son. Is your seatbelt on? Yeah. Knowing that the car could explode at any time, Coleman and his colleague risked their lives to pull the suspect away from the burning wreck. While firefighters arrive on the scene, the officers, now clear of the unstable car, try to calm the shocked driver by asking him questions. Be still and but they soon get a shock of their own. Well, how old are you? Fifteen. Fifteen? I thought I had a real old person. <laughs> Before long, an ambulance is on the scene, ready to rush the underage driver to the emergency room. Across town, the suspect's mother is in bed, blissfully unaware of what just happened. And I was asleep and the doorbell rang and rang and rang and rang and we just thought we were dreaming. When Tina finally gets to the door, she finds a deputy waiting with solemn news. Her son has just been in a devastating accident. I said, no, Jeremy's upstairs in bed. And he said, no, oh no, ma'am, he's been in an accident. And I said, who is he with? And he said, he was driving. I said, that's not possible. He doesn't have driver's license or a permit. And he said, yes, ma'am. I said, what was he driving? He said, a Cadillac. And I knew then that he had taken my Cadillac and my keys. Tina and her family hurry to the hospital, but their route passes right by the accident scene. I just totally lost it. When I saw that car, I just knew there was no possible way he could be alive. The Tannehill family tries to remain calm as they make their way to the critical care unit. The next few hours will be a test of their strength. Today, Tina watches the dash cam footage of the crash, trying hard to fight back the tears. 
Her son Jeremy sits by her side, thankful to be alive. I would never run from the law again. If it wasn't for that police officer, I would have died that night. You get to where you want to drive so bad, but you're really not ready, and you think you are. Well, I really do owe my life to Deputy Coleman. Nobody else would have just ran out there and put their life on the line with power lines down, a car on fire that could have blew up and killed us both. Really amazing what some people do for others. Miraculously, Jeremy escaped the crash with relatively minor injuries. But it turns out that this was the third time he'd stolen the family car. His mother is confident it will be his last. He had to go through surgeries to have his um, heel rebuilt and all that and a lot of pain. And I think through the pain of going through all that and walking on crutches and being in a wheelchair and learning how to do everything like that, I think he's definitely learned his lesson. But I would not be stupid enough not to sleep with my keys. <laughs> it's called swooping. And it's a new form of skydiving that gets its name from the characteristic swoop-like landing. A swoop is when you dive your parachute at the ground, build up as much speed as you can, and then pull the parachute out of the dive, go along the ground as long as you can or as far as you can. For swoop competitor Nathan Gilbert, the thrill comes not simply from jumping out of airplanes, but from the quest for a perfect landing. But any professional skydiver will tell you that their success rate is less than perfect. If you swoop, you definitely will make mistakes. Nathan Gilbert is about to experience one of those mistakes firsthand. The idea for the landing was to go down in between the two palm trees and then through the grass strip in between the deck and the sheds and then up over the fence and land on the other side. On his approach, Gilbert's chute clips a palm tree. His friends are on hand to videotape the event. But what they get is a potentially life-altering crash landing. The second I realized I was gonna hit the fence, I just wanted to make sure that I had my feet up as high as I could so I could take the force on the bottom side of my legs. With only seconds available to brace for impact, Gilbert uses his legs to soften the blow to his back and spine. Gilbert is shaken by the landing, but he's still in one piece. The actual effects of the landing upon my body were I didn't have any broken bones, but I sure was bruised and beat up. Incredibly, this terrifying crash does little to dampen Gilbert's enthusiasm for his sport. In no time, he's back, jumping into the wild blue yonder, still in search of that perfect landing. Dark down there. We'll have to On the edge of Los Angeles, a car thief runs from the law. This guy is just driving extremely fast. LAPD right in behind him on the 118 freeway. While the driver is young and desperate, the pursuing officers are calm and professional. I got off the Their department's pursuit policy is to hold back and not use force to end a chase. On to Rinaldi at how close he is coming to some of those cars uh, as he makes. Out of concern for innocent motorists. They'll wait for the perfect moment to get their man. And uh, he's got a red light up ahead here. Cars are stopped at the intersection, hard on the brakes. And it looks like he's trying to make his way on the wrong side of the road. Makes a right turn now, or in behind This hands-off policy has served them well, but they can't control the recklessness of a scared young kid. All we know right now, hard on the brakes, wrong side of the road, makes a quick left turn, and the suspect hits that car, loses control, now spins around. It's not over yet. He's continuing now and goes face to face with the LAPD. Now He was simply going too fast to steer around a car in his path. And the suspect hits that car. He fishtailed and his stolen Honda ended up in a perfect position to slip nimbly between pursuing units. Face to face with the LAPD. With their hands effectively tied, officers can only hope this young thief ends this chase on his own before causing any more damage. As the suspect continues at a very high rate of speed, it's extremely dangerous right now. The driver barrels beneath a freeway overpass. When he emerges, he rashly decides to turn right onto a side street. He hits a street sign and stops. Slows down, makes a right turn, and right into a curb there, into the divider. That's it. He, it's all over. Foot bail. Suspect now running. He's on foot. LAPD's got a helicopter overhead. He's not going to go anywhere without them seeing it. And there you can see, black and white now approaching. And uh, he's trying to get away from the officers, trying to evade them. The night sunlight is right on him. 
Suspect continues to run southbound now. And, uh, Police don't know if this car thief is armed, but pursuing officers can't wait any longer. The perfect moment they've been waiting for is now. I think he'd run out of steam, but he's not. The LAPD right there in foot chase. And it looks like that officer is going to be able to catch up. Uh, look at him. He's just a few feet away. He's now in the middle of the intersection. It's all over. He tackles him in the middle of the street. That's it. Foot chase is over. Code 4 suspect now in the custody of the LAPD. And it looks like he came very close to Officers may have been tempted to intervene earlier. And the suspect hits that car. Loses but they wisely kept their distance and waited until the time was right to spring into action and bring down a car thief. In the middle of the street. That's it. It's all over. In Idaho, a helicopter hovers 1,200 feet above the ground. It's just high enough for the person inside to do this. Hurtling out of a chopper a quarter mile above the earth may not be everyone's idea of a good time. But for Eric Lyman, founder and president of Over the Edge Incorporated, it's a way of life. And as with every plunge he arranges, safety is Lyman's primary concern. First, he checks the jumper's harness, making sure every hook and line is tightly secured. Next, Eric and his crew mate check the bungee, or shock cord, to make sure that there are no rips or tears. Once the cord is thoroughly inspected and properly laid out, Eric gives the helicopter pilot the all clear, and it's time to ascend. As the chopper climbs, the anxious jumper watches the cars beneath him getting smaller and smaller. They soon reach the proper altitude for the plunge. Everyone holds their breath, and the countdown finally begins. And he goes. It's a perfect jump. The 300-foot shock cord stretches to nearly twice its length, snapping up the adrenaline junkie just yards before he hits the ground. As the thrill of rocketing towards the Earth subsides, the jumper prepares for his landing. He has thrown a 30-foot static cable from his waist to the ground crew. And now, all they have to do is pull him in. But there's a problem. He's falling too fast. Every muscle on the man's body tenses up as he braces for impact. Amazingly, the shock cord pulls back and the jumper gently bounces off the dirt. But the recoil rips the static line from the ground crew's hands. Without that line, Eric Lyman and his crew have no way of safely bringing the jumper down. The man takes an excruciating hit right to the spine. This time, the ground technicians grab him before he can rise and fall again. The crew members carefully pull the jumper to the ground. Lyman sits with the injured man while he tries to catch his breath. As the helicopter comes in for its landing, the wounded jumper tries to take a few steps, but he's hurt too badly. It'll take several hours before he's able to walk, and a full month before he can stand without pain. Eric Lyman and his staff take every conceivable precaution to make sure the people who come to them have a safe jump. But when it comes to bungee jumping from a helicopter, even Eric admits that no plan is foolproof. Although Lyman still maintains that bungee jumping is safer than most sports, today's leap just goes to show you're not truly safe until both feet are firmly on the ground. A Miami Coast Guard boat has spotted this boatload of Haitian refugees. The local news helicopter is first on the scene. There are at least three to four hundred Haitian migrants that have just ran ashore. They, they were on this boat, the, about 30 foot vessel. The sad thing is that these people have scrimped, saved and borrowed $1,000 each to get on this boat with the false promise of citizenship in America. They can't wait to get ashore. This is the promised land. This is the US of A. They gladly help one another, lifting small children from the boat, dressed in their finest clothes to greet what they believe will be their new country. They stagger as their sea legs touch solid ground for the first time in a week. This is not an easy walk from the boat to the shore by any means. There are a lot of sharp, jagged rocks. But they think it's all worth it now to finally get here, to see the beautiful city of Miami. Because these people have fled from the ravages of both poverty and political persecution. Seeing this pickup headed into the city, they jump in the back. And uh, these people are just trying to get on. The driver says he's sorry he can't take them. 
When the police arrive, the refugees are actually glad to see them. They've been told in Haiti that they will quickly be processed, given asylum, and set on the road to U.S. citizenship. But the cruel truth is that none of what they've been told is true. This is not going to be the welcome they expected. In all likelihood, none of these brave people will ever be allowed to stay. And as the police arrive and start to arrest people, the looks of joy are turned to disbelief. This boy's starting to realize he's not welcome. This is not going to be a new home and a new hope. Buses take these once hopeful refugees to where they will be incarcerated before being sent back to Haiti. But still, they do not abandon all hope because brave and determined people who want liberty this badly will surely find a way to try again. Let's go back. There are three separate fire and rescue teams surrounding this manhole, one team for each of the unconscious men trapped inside. Captain Neil White of the Jacksonville, Florida Fire Department is one of the rescuers on scene. And they dispatched us. Uh, as soon as I heard the call going out, uh, it sounded like it was going to be something serious. It was supposed to be a simple three-man contracting job. Fix a few cracks in the sewer to make way for a new section of drain pipe. The problem started when one of the men suddenly passed out. One of them went down in the hole. We got overcome. Uh, his buddy went down there to try to uh, rescue him. He got overcome. The third person went down in there, and, and he got overcome. By the time rescuers get to the scene, the comatose construction workers have been in the oxygen deficient tunnel for more than 30 minutes. At this point, the men could have already suffered irreversible brain damage. But until firefighters know exactly what caused the workers to lose consciousness, they can't put themselves at risk by going into the hole. Still, something has to be done fast for the sake of the victims. All three of them were tangled up very badly. There's just like a, a wad of spaghetti down the hole. One of them had his face down in the water. The rescuers immediately begin pumping air into the sewer, but the oxygen levels are not improving. The hazmat team was there, and I asked what kind of readings they were getting, and at that point, they were getting a 15 to 16 percent oxygen level. There's still no movement from the victims. A firefighter will have to go in to retrieve them, wearing a cumbersome air mask and heavy tank. With just a few inches to move on all sides, an apprehensive Randy White begins his slow, claustrophobic descent. Go watch out, some of you watch it. Once in the hole, White struggles to come up with a quick plan of action. Randy had his hands full just trying to untangle the three bodies. Plus, it was physically demanding in the hole. It was kind of tight, and all three of the men were pretty good-sized men. And uh, the air didn't seem to last as long as you might think. With the fireman's oxygen running low, something has to be done fast before the victim count rises. Rescuers lower an aluminum ladder into the hole. Using a length of rope and the ladder's sturdy rungs, Randy White improvises a harness. It works. The victim is securely fixed to the ladder, but just barely clinging to life. He has virtually no vital signs. While one rescue team works on getting him to a stretcher, the other teams go after the remaining men. Firefighter Alan Mallard steps up to relieve Randy White in the hole. This time, rescuers use a harness attached to a mechanical winch to pull the victim out. Like the first man, this victim is completely unresponsive. Paramedics insert a breathing tube into the man's trachea, desperate to pump clean oxygen into his lungs. But there is still one more man in the hole, and by this point, even the rescuers with their oxygen tanks are finding it hard to breathe. After the second victim, the uh, rescuer that's in the hole started to run low, low on air, so I was up and went in to assist in getting the, uh, the last victim out. All eyes are on Captain Neil White as he nervously makes the final climb down into the deadly tube. The most important thing is just knowing your limitations and what you can and can't do and make sure you have enough backup and people there in case the rescuers get in trouble. White quickly secures the third man and rescuers begin lifting him out. But the man has been unconscious and without clean air for more than 40 minutes. And with the other construction workers in roughly the same shape, the mood among rescuers is anything but celebratory. I had told my crew, I said, they're probably not going to make it. Paramedics immediately rush the men into waiting ambulances. Now it's up to doctors to save their lives. We had a call from fire rescue that there were three men being extricated from a manhole 
and all three of them were unconscious and not breathing. About 15 minutes later, uh, all three of those individuals arrived at the emergency department. After several tests, Dr. Nibs and his team discover what caused the men to initially pass out, and it's serious. The signs and symptoms that they had was consistent with hydrogen sulfide poisoning. Permissible exposure limits are between five and 10 parts per million for a very short period of time. When inhaled directly, the naturally occurring sewer gas, hydrogen sulfide, can paralyze the lungs. And these victims breathed in nearly 80 times the permissible limit. The men are treated in a hyperbaric chamber. The treatment is supposed to remove the hydrogen sulfide from the red blood cells by hyperoxygenating the bloodstream. But the construction workers received more than a lethal dose of the poison, and there's no guarantee that the treatment will work. For now, doctors can only monitor the victims and wait. Guys, it was in a Less than a week later, Jacksonville Fire and Rescue receives a surprise visit from an unlikely person, victim Tony Matthews. I don't know what to tell y'all fellas. I mean, I am just blessed to be here, and uh, thank you very much. I mean, I owe my life to y'all. I mean, it's, it's wonderful to be here. Tony was the second man out of the sewer, and though all of the men eventually make a full recovery, he's the quickest to pull through. But today, as Tony watches the video of his ordeal, he appreciates just how close he and his crew came to death. He realizes now that he and his buddies made the mistake of trying to rescue each other on their own. Luckily, thanks to the Jacksonville Fire and Rescue crew, there's one thing Tony Matthews and the other victims can now agree on. It was teamwork that prevented this hole in the ground from becoming their grave. In Leesburg, Florida, Officer Stephen Kennedy is about to experience how quickly things can go wrong for a police officer. Since Kennedy is alone on a simple car stop, he tells the driver to stay in the vehicle. He just wants to tell him that his plate light is out, a fix-it ticket. But when he approaches the vehicle, things start to go wrong. Hey, fucking vehicle off. As Officer Kennedy reaches the car, several things happen at once. The passenger jumps out. The driver starts the car. And when Kennedy reaches in to turn off the ignition, the driver grabs the officer, holds on, and speeds away. The passenger watches in amazement as Kennedy, almost falling under the wheels, is thrown into a ditch with a shoulder injury so severe he is unable to move. And the reason for all this? The driver did not want the officer to know that he was driving on a suspended license. The driver was arrested within hours. But for Officer Kennedy, it remains a lesson in how little warning you get when a situation is about to change. This is Sergeant Lisa Don walking her beat. And everything is about to go wrong for her, with no warning whatsoever. In Knoxville, Tennessee, this squad car is parked in the heavily patrolled area near the university. Across the street, he sees another patrol car. The camera in the other car is monitoring traffic. As this traffic officer turns, he sees Sergeant Don. He also sees a young woman driving this car. The driver never even slowed down. The traffic cop comes around quickly as several officers rush to get Sergeant Don the medical assistance that will save her life. But the really deplorable aspect of this accident was revealed only later. The 18-year-old driver of this white car was drunk and coming from a local bar. When Sergeant Don recovered, she filed a $15 million lawsuit, claiming that the bar had served the girl knowing full well she was underage. When you're a police officer, there's only one thing you can count on. The knowledge that everything can change at the moment you least expect it. In Toyokawa, Japan, there is an ancient ritual that marks the passage of adolescent boys into manhood, and it is literally a trial by fire. A week before the annual fireworks festival, Ekahito Katayoka takes his son Hidetaka to the forest outside their village to prepare for the ritual. Come a giant firecracker. 
It is then carefully wrapped with straw rope. As bizarre as it may have seemed, the display was a culmination of a process that required strength